Um, open up your scriptures to Matthew 16. And while you're opening it to Matthew 16, let me tell you just um, what a sweet thought I had this morning um, as I got up to come this morning. This is my third time I've had the privilege of coming before this congregation and preaching. Um, but it's the first time I've been able to stand up and preach to a congregation that I'm now doing life with. Um, we haven't quite gone through the new members class. I blame that on Mike. Um, but, but Lord willing, we'll, we'll be members soon. And so um, I am very, very glad, very pleased and honored again to be asked to open up the scriptures um, and exhort this congregation, my congregation, um, this morning. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, I just ask that this time would be profitable, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ would be exalted. Protect those that are hearing my words from anything that I might say that is unworthy, that is untrue, that diminishes the name of your Son. And God, I ask that you would endow with your, with, with your Spirit that the truth of your word, that the exaltation of your Son and the supremacy of his work may be known and manifest even here this morning. And we pray this in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. I'm preaching this morning on Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Um, I hope we can do it all. So I've got a lot to say, so I'm just going to ask that we listen fast. Starting in verse 13, the scriptures read this way. Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is. And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ, the word of the Lord. About 10, 15 years ago, a movie was, was put out called Talladega Nights, the ballad of Ricky Bobby. Um, some some have, have seen it. Um, there, there's, this, there's this scene in the movie that, that stands out. It's... Um, for some, it's out-and-out out hilarious. For others, it's just blasphemous. But I remember watching it for the first time, and, and the scene is they're about to sit down to have a meal, and Ricky Bobby starts praying over the meal, and he starts praying to sweet Lord, dear Lord, baby Jesus. And his wife interrupts him and says, Jesus grew up. And Ricky Bobby responded back and said, I don't care, I like the baby Jesus. I like the baby Jesus better. And then a conversation around the table ensued where Ricky's son said, well, you know, I kind of like to imagine Jesus as ninja Jesus, you know, fighting people. And, and one of his other friends says, well, you know, I kind of like the party Jesus. And, and they all have these different impressions of who Jesus was. And, and Ricky said, well, it doesn't really matter. I'm still just going to pray to the little eight-pound, four-ounce baby Jesus. And a lot of Christians got up in arms about it because it clearly was somewhat blasphemous. But on the other side of the coin, it was quite telling. Because I think what they were doing is what most of us actually do. I think we have our own impressions of Jesus, and I think we gravitate to that Jesus. And when we talk about Jesus, we talk about the Jesus that we most admire or most like failing to recognize that Jesus is much larger, much more um, significant, 
than our imaginations bear witness to. I, but this isn't just a problem of today. This, is, this has been, been an issue that's been going on throughout the centuries. Yurslav Pelikan, uh, the great Yale historian, had written a book called Jesus Throughout the Centuries, where he contoured how people saw Jesus, how they understood him through the centuries, from the first century all the way to present, and how the images of, Christ's, uh, of Christ had shifted and, and changed as the culture shifted and changed. Even right now, I'm working on a particular academic project where I'm looking at the art motif called the Man of Sorrows that developed in the 12th and 13th century, which is an art motif, and, and you see it in, in paintings and frescoes, and you see it in various sculptures, of as Christ is coming off the cross as a dead man, he's actually still in agony. And, and part of the reason for it, and we can talk about this all day long, is because the people of the 12th and 13th and 14th centuries were suffering that they identified with Jesus, the suffering servant. And, and we get those images and those, those pictures in our mind. And in the eight, 19th century, really, the 19th and 20th century, we see other movements arise. Many of you are probably familiar with the Jesus Seminar, um, both the first, second, and third one, and the various searches for the historical Jesus. And what, what was being done during this time in the mid to late 19th century going into the 20th century is people were seeking to make... Um, to humanize Jesus, if you will. And when one, one theologian said this, he said, out of all of these pursuits, out of all of the attempts to go ahead and find who the real Jesus is, you have these theologians looking into a wishing well and seeing nothing more than a reflection of themselves. And I want to caution us this morning as I approach this text that we're not making Jesus in our image. That rather we have to come to recognize that we've actually been created in his likeness and we need to come to terms with that first. And this was the very question that Christ was addressing here in Matthew 16. He had already been through Jerusalem, he had worked his way up into Galilee, he had been doing miracles, he was preaching the gospel, he was healing the sick, he was healing the blind, he was even raising the dead. And here it says that they come to the district of Caesarea Philippi. This is an area 25 miles north of Galilee, and, and this is actually, I think, fairly important. We're going to come to this point here in just a moment. And he asks his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, I think what's important for us to notice is that the answers that they give, they're not necessarily bad answers in the sense of seeking to degrade who Christ is. Rather, the answers were, or could have been particularly flattering, given the context of the situation. I mean, they said, some say you're John the Baptist. Like, clearly, they're making reference to just a couple of chapters before. If you remember, Herod had um, John the Baptist beheaded. And as he's looking at the ministry of Christ, you see the fear of Herod sink in and say, this is John the Baptist resurrected, coming for judgment. He knew what, what he did. Others said that he was Elijah, and, and certainly this, this has scriptural warrant to it. Malachi, chapter 4 at the very end, says that they're anticipating the coming of Malachi. Now, they don't understand what Christ ended up teaching them several chapters earlier, that the Malachi, that was, or the, uh, excuse me, the Elijah that was to come um, was John the Baptist, or uh, excuse it was John the Baptist, but nevertheless, it was still flattering. Some were saying Jeremiah. And, and this is true with a lot of their writings. They understood that there was going to be a prophet, perhaps a resurrected Jeremiah that was going to come and, and proclaim the covenant blessings and judgments upon those who, who disobeyed the law of God and broke and violated his covenant. And others were crying out, he's a prophet. Again, all of these are flattering. All of these... Um, 
conceptions that these people had of Christ were not derogatory, but they were inadequate. And as we look around at our contemporary culture and as we look around at our friends and our family and those who we live life with, we see all kinds of conceptions of Jesus that aren't necessarily wrong, but they're inadequate. Sometimes we talk about Jesus just being the savior of our sins. And that's true. But that's not all he is. Sometimes we talk about Christ as the great social reformer. That too is true. But that's not all he is. Sometimes we speak of Christ as the one who heals our hurts. That is also true. But it's still not the still not quintessentially all that Christ is. And here we see Christ turn his attention after he asks this question to the disciples, who do people say that I am? And he turns it and he says, well, who do you say that I am? And you have Peter, like so often, jumping out of his seat. You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And he nails it. He gets it. There is nothing more important to Christianity than who Christ is and what he did. And what you have in Peter's embodied statements, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, was an encapsulation of all that Christ is, all of who he is, and what he's about to do. And here in Matthew 16, you have this climactic movement of Christ's ministry to this point to where he says, who do you say I am? And they're crying out, we know who you are. You are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. The Messiah. The Christ. The anticipated one. The, the, the one from whom the very beginning speaks of. Pastor Mike just spent a great deal of time walking through Genesis and the origins of, um, of our great faith. And if you remember at the very beginning of Genesis, you know, we, we have Adam and Eve that are, that are established in the garden. And what are they to do? We have this cultural, this creation mandate to subdue the earth, to fill it, to, to, to multiply, to make the world a dwelling place, an appropriate dwelling place for God Almighty. And here they act treasonously. And the, the penalty for that treason is death. But yet before God pours out his declarations of judgment and punishment upon Adam and Eve, he gives them the great hope in that, that thing that we call the proto-evangelium, that really fancy theological word that just means the first gospel. Before Christ declares judgment upon the people, he makes the declaration to the serpent that there is going to be war between the seed of the serpent and the seed of woman, and the serpent's head will be crushed, and the heel of the seed who crushes the serpent will be bruised. In layman's terms, to break that down, what he ends up saying is there's going to be this cosmic battle that ensues. And in this cosmic battle, my promises and my intention for humanity is going to be fulfilled as chaos and evil are destroyed and the world is made an appropriate dwelling place for me. That, that, that's what God affectionately says. God gives this promise. And we see just nine chapters later, God looking at Abraham and saying, Abraham, it's going to be through your seed that this promise is fulfilled. And then we see him give that promise to not just Abraham, but Isaac. And then we see him give it to Jacob. And then you get to Exodus. And if you remember, when he calls out Moses, he tells Moses, I've remembered the promises I've made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And what are those promises? But that all wrong things are going to be made right, that there's going to be this reversal of the curse, there's going to be the forgiveness of sins, my intention for humanity is going to be fulfilled. Now go into Egypt and get my people out. Right? And, and we don't just see it with Moses. We see it with David. 
In 2 Samuel, God looks at David and says, my promises are going to be through your line. It's going to be fulfilled through you. And what do you then see through the prophets? Over and over and over again, the reminding them of the covenant promises of God that, that he's going to be their God, they will be his people, and God's promises are going to be fulfilled in them. And that, that all of their anticipation of the renewal and the fixing and the reversal of sin and the curse is going to be taken care of. And if they disobey, and if they're not his people, they will be judged. But God's promises will be fulfilled, and God is faithful. And you see this over and over and over and over and over again until you get to Matthew chapter 1, where you see Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Why? Because Christ is the Messiah. He's the anticipated one. He's the one that all of their hopes and dreams for thousands upon thousands of years had been bent. This was their very hope standing before them. And you have Peter confessing to this. You're the Messiah. All of our hopes and dreams have been bent on you and your coming and your arrival. And you're standing here right now. One of my favorite passages is Matthew 11. I'm going to ask you to flip over, flip back just a couple of chapters. Because I think this really does encapsulate um, this, this concept of Messiah. It encapsulates the concept of, of the work of Christ in all of its glory. Matthew 11 said, When Jesus had finished instructing the twelve, he went on from there to teach and preach in other cities. Now John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ. Now this is John the Baptist before he died. He was in prison. He's about to die. Remember we just talked about it. he gets beheaded by Herod. He's there in prison. He hears of the works and the deeds of Christ. And he sends word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered, You go and tell John what you've heard, what you hear and what you see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the good news and the gospel preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Now, I used to get irritated by this, because it, it feels as though Jesus isn't answering John's question. John sends his disciples to Christ and says, are you the one or should we expect somebody else? And then in Jesus' most cryptic way, I thought, Jesus was saying, well, just go tell them, tell them what you hear and see. That the lame are walking, the blind are receiving sight, the lepers are being healed, the dead are being raised. You go tell them that. Go tell them that, that the gospel is being preached. I'm like, well, is he really answering it? Well, the answer is he is answering it. But he's answering it in a way that was completely unexpected. Now, we don't know the mind of John. We don't know the psyche of John as he's asking. Perhaps it's John's disciples that are the ones that are on, on edge. And John the Baptist fully recognizes and understands what Jesus is going to do. After all, it was John the Baptist who stood there and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Remember that? Um, we don't know John's psyche. But here's what we do know. We do know that there was this belief that was implicit among the first century Jews that the Messiah was just to come and take care of the political, the, socio, the socioeconomic, the political, geopolitical situation of the day. And it may be that this question was, John the Baptist is rotting in prison. He's about to be beheaded. You're supposed to be the Messiah. Are you going to get John out of prison and keep him from dying? That may have been the question. Because if you are, when are you going to do it? If, I mean, if you can kind of follow that, that, that train of logic. It may have been that they're seeing John the Baptist in prison, and they're thinking, is this guy really the Messiah? Did, Jesus mess, did, did John mess up? Could have been that also. We're not really sure what the psyche is, but whatever it was, their question was, how do I say it lightly, um, was problematic from the very first word. 
Because Jesus does answer their question. He answers their question by quoting two passages, Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 40. And if you understand the context of Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 40, Jesus is clearly looking at them and actually rebuking them. Are you the one, they say to Jesus? And Jesus says, not only am I the one, I'm not here just to restore the nation of Israel and to punish the Roman Empire. I am here to claim the entire cosmic order. That my deeds are a reflection, that my kingdom goes beyond just the borders of the Roman Empire. My kingdom extends beyond the borders of this world. In fact, the entire cosmos is bending its knee at my word. That when you look at sin and you look at the curse, I'm reversing it before your very eyes. You're concerned about John the Baptist being beheaded. I'm telling you, I'm the one that can give him his head back and raise him again. Ooh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. This, Thank you, Lord. Thank you. This is the gospel we're talking about. Mm. This is, the, this is the, the Messiah that that Peter is proclaiming before the other disciples. We know who you are. They're, the disciples' dreams, the thoughts of the first century Jews, were too minuscule to encapsulate the embodiment of what it was that Christ was actually doing. And I'm afraid, and this is an encouragement to you, I'm afraid that sometimes our imaginations don't embody the fullness and the greatness of the supremacy of what Christ has actually come to do and accomplish as the Messiah. Has he come to die and rise, raise again for your sins? Yes. But that's not all he's come to do. He's come to fight your battles, destroy your enemies, reestablish the cosmos, and set his kingdom up on high so that not one object, not one molecule will fall outside of his control. And right here, we have Peter looking at Christ and we say, we know who you are. It becomes a little more potent when you look at how Christ describes himself in the second portion of Peter's declaration. You remember the question that Jesus began with? Who do people say the Son of Man is? Right? And then he asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? So we recognize fully that Christ is declaring himself to be the Son of Man. And then you have Peter crying out, you're the Christ, you're the Son of the living God. This idea of the Son of Man and the Son of living God has to do with the person of Christ, not just his work. Now, one of Christ's favorite um, titles for himself is the Son of Man, but it's very important to understand where this concept go comes from, why Christ claims the Son of Man title to himself, and what Peter means when he says the Son of the living God. Flip with me all the way back over to Deuteronomy, or excuse me, Daniel chapter 7. Look at Daniel chapter 7. Now, a couple of years ago, um, when we were at the other campus, I preached a Christmas sermon, um, and it had a little bit to do with, with this particular text. But I, I want you to understand this text. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel's having this vision, and in this vision... He, he sees this, this sea, and the sea is a matter of chaos. And out of the sea come these monsters and come these creatures. Um, and as these monsters, they're, they're very perverted monsters, very perverted creatures. And then let's pick up in verse 9 of chapter 7. This is Daniel. He says, As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him, and thousands and thousands served him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. And the court sat in judgment, and the books were open. 
right? He's got this vision of God. Now, you've got these creatures coming out, and then he beholds, you know, God sitting on his throne, and he's got this chariot of fire. And just to kind of put these things in, in context for you, um, a chariot in the ancient Near East is like having like an F-22 or an F-35 today. That's, um, compared, and it, but, he, but he sees this, this fiery chariot, um, this, this, this war horse, if you will, that, um, that the Ancient of Days is sitting on. And then look in verse 11. It says, I looked then because of the sound of the great words of the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to, uh, to be burned with fire. And the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away and their lives were prolonged for a season at a time. So get, again, get this picture. We don't have time to get into all of this. One of the beasts is completely destroyed. All the other ble- beasts are subject to the dominion of this particular one and their life extended until the time to where this one decides to go ahead and just destroy them. Follow me on this so far. Verse 13. I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Do you understand that Jesus is claiming for himself this position? Jesus has been saying this entire time. I'm the son of man. I'm the one to whom all kingdoms and nations and peoples will bow down to. Who do these other people say that the son of man is? I mean, this is what he's saying. Who does everyone else say that I am the Lord of heaven and earth? Peter gets it. He says, you're the Messiah. You're the one. You're the one we expect. But, but you are the son of the living God. This phrase, son of the living God, shouldn't fall on, on deaf ears. Think about other places where we hear this. Do you remember Christ's baptism? Do you remember what the father said to Christ as he was baptized? This is my son with whom I'm pleased. You know, we, 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 we talk about baptism and the need for the sacrament of baptism, but, but we sometimes fail to talk about the significance of Christ's baptism, which is a little bit different than ours. Um, Christ was being set apart. He was being coronated as king, just like the ancient Near Eastern kings of Israel. If you remember what would happen, the prophet would call the king out. The king would be anointed. You'd have this declaration of who this king is. And then the king would go off to battle in war and fight. That was the pattern of kingship. We see it with Saul. We see it with David. And we also see it with Jesus. Oh, and by the way, you guys know with the, the, the battle David fought, right? David's called out to be king. And then he goes and fights Goliath. You know, it's not small guys like beating up big guys. It's David, who's the king of Israel, the rightful king of Israel, called out by the Lord himself is now defeating the enemies of Israel. That, but we can preach on that later. Um, but but, you, but you, see, you see this in the baptism of Christ. Christ is, is ba- he's called out by the last prophet, right? John the Baptist, it's, there he is, the Christ, the Lamb of God. He's baptized. The Father speaks and says, this is my son with whom I am pleased. And then who does Jesus go and fight? Every time. He goes into the wilderness and defeats the devil in land that is not belonging to him. He is on a war-torn path to defeat and to conquer. One of the beautiful things about Matthew, actually, if you, if you look back to it, just in this overall context, the way that the, the whole uh, scene ends between Satan and Christ in the wilderness, it's not Jesus licking his wounds, frail and weak and mild Jesus who somehow is... is incompetent to fight his battles he tells the devil go and the devil takes off and then all of a sudden you have these ministering angels what's so fascinating about these ministering angels is it's not that these angels are coming to nurse jesus the ministering angels are actually a war council 
coming to Christ now that he's established his battle and his rightful place as king, coronated by John the Baptist, declared by the Father as the Son of God, to now go on to marching orders to take over the world. I mean, this, this is the Jesus we sometimes don't, don't, don't see or we don't want to see because we already have our own images of who Jesus is. But here's what's so interesting. Why is it that the Father says, this is my son? And why is it that Peter cries out and says, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God? Well, the answer is in Psalm 2. Flip over to Psalm 2. This was a um, kingly coronation psalm. Whenever they would coronate new kings, the psalm would be read within the presence of the assembly. Listen to the whole psalm. I'll break it up. Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their, bound, their, bound, their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Do you hear this? You've got all these nations and all these kings seeking to rise up against God and his people. Verse 4. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your, possess your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. You understand this? This... This is, this is where Peter's getting it. You're the Messiah. You're the expected one. You've, everything that you're doing, everything that, 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 you, that you are, that, that, that we're seeing before us is, is defying all of our expectations. But beyond that, you are the son of man. You are the son of the living God, the rightful heir of the throne, and you are going to break the backs of all of your enemies, and here we stand with you. That's exactly what Peter's getting at. You're the son of man. All dominions, all thrones belong to you. You, in fact, are the son of the living God. You've been declared to be the son by the father, and the declaration of being son means you are the king most high, and to you and to you alone do we give all of our allegiance, and do we bow our knee, and you alone, and to you we kiss, because if we don't, we will perish like the rest. You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. We know who you are. Jesus responds to Peter. And he said, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Now, there could be a lot of reasons for blessing. But I... This is, this is just suspicion. One of the primary reasons for blessing is because of the psalm we just read. He's acknowledging the Son. And he's taking refuge in the Son. And there's only blessing in refuge with the Son. Simon Barjona, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. My Father who is in heaven has. And I also say that you are Peter. And upon this rock, I'll build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overpower it. There's a lot that can be said, but let me specifically focus on this concept of the rock. Um, 
there's so much controversy in so, so many different areas of, of the scriptures. This is just one of the many controversial areas that we look at scripture. There's three primary views that are taken here. When, when Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. I call you Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. People say, okay, wh- what exactly is the rock? Or who is the rock? And here are the three different views. The first view has a long history. Um, and it's not just a history among Roman Catholics. There's also a large history among Protestants as well that see Peter as the rock. Now, the reason for this is because you have this, this word play that's going on. It's almost as though Jesus says, who do people say that I am? Peter says, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. And then Jesus says, now that you've told me who I am, let me tell you who you are. That's kind of the, the, the feeling. And I'm going to tell you that you're really Peter, rock, and upon this rock, I'll build my church. And, and so there's a long history of people saying, well, Peter is that rock. Um, and, and it very well could be, quite frankly. I'm just going to tell you, I've been, I've been looking at this text for about 25 years. Um, I think I was looking at it what, 26 years ago was the first time I really started just kind of pouring over this thing. Um, and, and let me just say this up front. I've changed my position probably a dozen times. Um, my position today um, was different like five or six years ago, but it's the position I was holding like 10 years ago. Um, so I, I'm giving you these just, just to be thinking through them. You guys can, can determine on your own. Ask Mike. He'll tell you what the right answer is. Um, but, but this is the idea, right, that, that Peter is the rock and that based upon the foundation of P- both Peter's apostleship and the rest of the apostles, the church will be built. Now, we find at least Paul making some kind of mention of this possibility in Ephesians 2.20. In Ephesians 2.20, he talks about how the apostles are a foundation upon which the church is built. Very well could be. Very well could be. A second position is that Peter's confession is the rock. That it's based upon this, this declaration that you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. That this becomes the foundation upon which the church is built. Now, there's a long history here, too. Um, A lot of times, Protestants uh, and and Presbyterians think that this is just a Protestant position, that this is a position that that we took up against Rome during the the Reformation. But in actuality, this is a position going as far back as the first and second century. Chrysostom once wrote, he said, on the rock, Chrysostom, that's a church father like thousands of years ago. Right, going, going way back. He, he said this. He said, on the rock, that is, the faith of his confession, he did not say Peter, for it, was upon, for it was not upon man, but upon the man's faith that the church is built. That's an early church father. You've got tons of other church fathers holding this too. You've got people like Gregory of Nicaea, Theophanes, John of Damascus. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. These two positions have gone back and forth. In fact, my, my theological hero, my, my best friend, um, Augustine, um, went back and forth on this. In fact, he, um, he wrote a recantation. If you didn't know, he, he wrote about his position, and then later in life he, he wrote a book of recantations where he said, this is where I was wrong in my past, but this is what I love about Augustine. He, he made an argument about what he believed in the past, and then he said, well, I recant that. So 20 or 30 years, he writes a recantation. And then after he reads that, writes that recantation, he comes back and writes another recantation about his recantation to say that he was wrong. Um, so I, I feel like I'm in, 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 a, in a good place not really having all of the answers. But I will say that the position that I hold here is actually Augustine's final position, I think. And it's a minority position um, within, within the church. And that is that it's neither Peter nor his confession that is the rock, but it's Christ himself. Um, to, to quote Augustine on this, he said that um, 
Augustine said, early, early, in my, early in my life, I used the argument that Peter was the rock against the Donatists. That was an early heresy. And he said, but I was mistaken because I believed that the rock could only be Christ. Again, it's a minority position, but I think he's right on this. And, and let me tell you why I think he is right. Well, for one, just so you know, in Matthew, both Matthew chapter 7 and then later in Matthew, Jesus actually refers to himself as the rock. Matthew 7, we talks about having the words and becoming the foundation upon which the house is to be built. And then later on, Matthew tells us that, that Jesus said that the stones that the builder rejected, which has become the very capstone, quoting the Psalms, that Christ was making reference to himself. But more than that, throughout the Old Testament, I think that there's some theological argument that can be made that throughout the Old Testament, God is constantly described as the rock of Israel. And it seems to me that this makes most sense when you understand the confession and the in the in the way that I've tried to lay out before you. First Peter, flip with me to First Peter chapter two. First Peter two. I think is is very important, persuasive to me, um, for whatever it's worth, um, because I think that this is Peter's own interpretation of the rock. That's First Peter chapter two. We'll look at verses 4 through 8. Peter says, For you came to him, that is Christ, as a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in the Scriptures... Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Verse 7. So the honor is for you who believe. For the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. What you have is Peter using Isaiah 28, Psalm 118, and Isaiah 8 to make a point. And the point is that the foundation of the church is, in fact, Christ. And it seems to me that um, he doesn't make a reference to him in this particular, him, himself, in this particular text. But whatever your position is, whatever you, whether you think Peter is the rock, whether you think the confession is the rock, whether you think Christ is the rock, here's what we know for certain. It is the work of Christ either in Peter or in the apostles or in the church that is what's most relevant here. It's not Peter on his own. It's not the apostles on his own. It's not the church on his own. But it's the power of Christ through the Spirit that the church finds its, its authority. In fact, Jesus says enough to Peter. Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. That this couldn't just be a work of Peter. If it is a work of Peter at all, it's got to come by way of the work of Christ through the power of his spirit, which grounds and establishes his church. And, and with remarkable clarity, after Jesus tells him, upon this rock and whatever that rock is, I'll build my church, what he says is that the gates of Hades cannot prevail against it. Now, this is weird phrasing. The gates of Hades, gates, like you talk about the gates of Hades, it, it seems to suggest a defensive, um, defensive protections. Right? You've got the gates of Hades here that's defending itself against the offense of the church. Uh, but then again, you've got that will not overcome. That suggests an offensive, not a defensive position. But what's probably true is the, the phrase gates of Hades is probably um, an idiom for the powers of death. 
And what we have Christ saying here is Peter, on this rock, whatever that rock is, it's grounded and established in who I am and what I'm doing for the church. And as the Christ, the son of the living God, nothing, absolutely nothing will overtake you or destroy you. What a powerful phrase. What a, what a powerful thing to say. Look in Matthew chapter 13. And while you turn to Matthew chapter 13, I want you again to turn to Daniel chapter 4. Now, we've heard these words of Christ. Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 31. It's the parable of the mustard seed, right? It says, he put another parable before them, saying, this is verse 31 of chapter 13 of Matthew. <clears throat> the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests on its branches. Now remember, Matthew is being written primarily to a Hebrew audience. This image would have captured any Hebrew that knew anything about their history. It's a mustard seed. It's going to grow strong. It's going to rise up. It's going to provide shade. It's, it's massive. It's going to be a, a place of protection. It's going to be a place of safety. Flip back to Daniel chapter 4. Starting in verse 9. O oh, Belshazzar, chief of the magicians. Now, now here, just the, the context here is Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, is having a dream. Remember who Nebuchadnezzar is? Nebuchadnezzar, the great warrior that ended up destroying Nineveh, burying it under 100 feet of dirt, going ahead and conquering out Jerusalem, bringing people into exile. But not only did he do that, the great builder the builder of Babylon. I mean, he's known not, you know, in the scriptures, he's, he's known for all sorts of stuff, but, but outside of the scriptures, he's known for building one of the biggest and greatest and most beautiful of civilizations. He had a ziggurat he built 700 feet tall in Babylon. That's, that's higher than the, the SunTrust building in Orlando. Put that in perspective. He's the guy who built the hanging gardens. He built a wall around Babylon so large that it could circle Chicago. And it was so big that you could fit two or three station wagons front end to front end across it so that you could ride multiple chariots on it. And with the majority of the bricks that he laid for this wall, he had stamped, I am Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Because he decided if anybody destroyed it, they need to know what wall or whose wall they destroyed. Great king. One of the biggest super kingdoms that the world has ever seen. And listen to what it says. O Belshazzar, this is, this is the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. He says, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods in you, there's no mystery too difficult for you. Tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. The visions of my head I lay in bed were these. I saw and behold, listen to this. This is Nebuchadnezzar's vision. Behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, <clears throat> and, its, and its height was great. The tree grew, became strong, and its top reached to heaven and was visible to the end of the whole earth. The leaves were beautiful and the fruit abundant, and it was food for all. The beasts found shade under it, and the birds of the heaven lived in its branches, and all flesh was, fled, was fed from it. Sound familiar? What happens? Verse 14, he proclaimed aloud and thus, chop down the tree, lop off its branches, strip off the leaves, scatter its fruit. He has this vision of this grand kingdom that we know as Babylon. Super kingdom. One of the most beautiful, eloquent, gorgeous kingdoms ever known to humanity. And it was struck down. But what we have in this parable in Matthew is that the kingdom that Christ is building this thing that the gates of Hades cannot overtake will become a kingdom so massive 
it will resemble Babylon, but with one distinction. It's not going to get chopped down because the gates of Hades cannot prevail against it. Now, here's what's so fascinating about this. Do you remember when I said the very beginning of this sermon that we're going to go take a look at where they're located? Do you remember that? They're located in Caesarea Philippi, which is 25 miles north of Galilee. You know what's significant about that? It's a place where they worship the Greek god Pan. It is as pagan as pagan can get. What's happening in Caesarea Philippi, in the land of the pagans? What's happening? Anybody know? Christ is building his church. Christ is building his church. He is establishing his authority. He is having his dominion proclaimed and known in the place of the pagans, in his enemy's camp. Because what is going on right now in the midst of the people as this proclamation is being made is that Christ is on the offensive, he is warring against the nations, and even that place where they are standing will bow their knee to him, and they cannot stop it. We don't have too much time to talk about the the keys of the kingdom. Um, Let me just say really quickly, there's all sorts of different thoughts about the keys of the kingdom um, and what they are. Suffice Suffice it to say that one thing that we can say about the keys of the kingdom is that all authority has been given to Christ. Christ has given that authority to his apostles. And we as the church and as the ministers of the gospel and those who have been entrusted with God's word are to march faithfully over the kingdoms that are opposing the kingdom of God and opposing the kingdom of Christ and establishing establishing. Um, faithful servants there in fulfilling the proto-evangelium by ensuring an appropriate dwelling place for the Lord. And there's what, st- lots of stuff that we can talk about but with a minute or two that I've got left. Let me go ahead and bring out a few applications when we're done. First, first application. Don't blaspheme Christ by making his work too small. When you talk about Christ, when you think about Christ, when you engage not just your fellow church members, but those who are outside of these walls. Don't blaspheme Christ by reducing him to your image. Make much of him. I promise you, you can't overstate the supremacy of Christ's person and work. Secondly, As Christians, there must be an optimism of hope for the Christian life. I'm not talking about just a a post-millennial optimism. If you're a post-millennialist, I think that's a good optimism to have, but I'm not talking about that just things are getting better. What I'm telling you is that the Christian faith is bent on the fact that we have a certain hope and that hope will never be stripped from us precisely because Christ is building his church and the gates of hell can't prevail against it. Sometimes life really does just suck. And I apologize for that. It just does. We all have pain. We all have sorrow. But as Christians, we've got to reflect on what Christ is doing and who he is that is doing it. He is undoing the curse. Our tears will be wiped away and there's not a person or institution or political organization that's going to put a kibosh on the work of Christ. And we need to stop pretending as though all of our hopes are bent in whoever the next political candidate is elected or not elected. That's just stupid because we don't belong to the kingdom of this world. We belong to the kingdom of Christ. And he's the king to whom every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, including whatever political ruler is or is not ruling at the moment. And that has to be our hope. That's not to say you shouldn't be engaged politically, but it is to say that your hope shouldn't be built upon your political engagement. Your hope should be built in and built around the work that Christ is doing within 
and through his church. Third, Christ is going to return very soon. By soon, it could be a thousand years, I don't know. But he is. And his return will be triumphant. Pastor Mike was praying this this morning. And whatever pains we have, whatever sufferings that we face, it will be done away with. It will be fully and finally vindicated. I, when I think about this, I think about Paul in 2 Corinthians talking about how they were, he, they were serving in ministry in such a way that their sufferings were so great that they were despairing of life. This is in, in 2 Corinthians 1. But what did Paul say? He goes, but so that our hope wasn't built in us, but in God, we placed our hope in God knowing that if needed be, he could even raise the dead. It's okay to grieve, but it's not okay not to have hope. And it's not okay to recognize that in the end, Christ is going to vindicate his church, his people by slaying our enemies. Man, that's a good thing. And we need to talk more about that. And finally, let me say this. Christ is the Messiah. He is the son of the living God. Kiss the son. Love him. And it should be made, this point should be made. If he is a king and you're close enough to kiss him, you're kissing his feet. My exhortation is bow and bow boldly. Let me pray.